This is invertebrates part two. Uh, we began with some very simple vertebrates that we did, vertebrates that we did uh, in class. And now um, we're going to go on and improve in our complexity of invertebrates. The first phylum is phylum Annelida. Annelida, annelids are segmented worms, are ringed worms, and the reason that we call them that is if you look at their body, it looks like there's little rings as you make your way down the body. And some of you are going to be like, like an earthworm, and you would be right. But there's some other critters in this group, like that one. As far as characteristics of invertebrates, and now you can see in this picture all the different segments that you, along the whole entire worm here. Um, they have bodies with segments, they have bilateral symmetry, and they have a true coelom. Okay, so true body cavity that's completely lined surrounding the gut. They are both terrestrial and aquatic, both salt and freshwater. They can be saprophytic, which means they're sort of decomposers, they eat dead stuff, and they can also be parasitic, like our little leech here on the end. <coughs> Examples include earthworms, which you all identify with, I think, reasonably well. Uh, polychaete worms, like sandworms or bristleworms. Also tube worms, and I'll show you a picture, I think I've got one in here somewhere, of what the body of a tube worm looks like, and you'll see the segments and why it's in this um, particular group. And then leeches, of course. I bet you didn't know, however, that there can be giant earthworms and they are found in Australia. And some of you would be like, of course. Um, they average one meter in length, but they've actually described one that was four meters in length. So they can be pretty big. Uh, they can take five years to reach maturity, and babies, when they're born out of their eggs, are 20 centimeters long. So that's uh, a good, probably almost two-thirds of a foot, so nine inches-ish or so. Uh, pretty good size, but not threatening, so don't freak out. Earthworms have well-developed digestive systems, well-developed circulatory system, well-developed nervous systems, well-developed reproductive systems. The only thing that earthworms don't have is a respiratory system. Um, they don't have a way of exchanging their gases uh, inside of their body. They have to do it through their skin. And the only way that that can happen is if their skin doesn't dry out. And it is a reason why if you find earthworms running around um, across concrete and they can't get back into the soil where it's moist, they will dry out and die. Examples of annelids include, as we've already mentioned, earthworms, bristleworms, tube worms, and leeches. Uh, let's see, do I still? No, I don't have another picture of the tube worm outside of its, uh, of its tube. Because here's another one down here, this one. This is also a tube worm. But you could all easily name the earthworm, the leech, and this little bristle worm on the, over here on the right. This takes us to phylum mollusca. The mollusks are everything you think about when you think of shells that you find at the beach. Um, they have fleshy bodies and not much else. Um, some of them have really well-developed eyes like our, our cephalopods. Um, we're only gonna talk about three groups here. But they have lots and lots and lots of diversity um, from your little garden snail that seems really simple all the way up to the giant squid. So crazy varieties of simplicity to complexity in this group. The characteristics of mollusca are that they have bilateral symmetry and a true body cavity, or coelom. They often have a hard shell composed of calcium carbonate. Most have a thick muscular foot, either used to open and close its shell, if it happens to have two shells, or it's used for movement, like in the case of snails. 
and they also have a mantle and it is the mantle that is responsible for producing the hard shell. Lastly, they have a visceral mass, which is basically where all the organs are. And this is where like the coelom comes into play. There is a body cavity that all of these guts sort of fill up. Everything from their gills to their um, reproductive systems to their digestive system, it's all in this body cavity. You can see it again here, we've got an outer shell, we've got a mantle, we've got a gut or visceral mass, we've got a fleshy foot, okay? Basic groups of mollusks include the gastropods, which are basically either single-shelled organisms or no-shelled organisms. So snails and slugs basically are in the gastropod group. Uh, they have characteristics like long stalked eyes and really fleshy feet that they use to move. Um, and they also have a specialized tongue for scraping algae because most of, well, or for drilling through shells because they're either herbivores or they're predatory carnivores. Bivalves have two shells and you can see that um, across the board here. It includes everything from mussels to scallops to oysters to clams to pen shells. And then last group, which all of you have probably been looking at down here because I've got this little gif going, or gif going, however you pronounce it, uh, are the cephalopods. Um, cephalopods are the most complex group, really, really well-developed nervous systems, quite smart, these guys. Um, it includes everything from squid to cuttlefish to octopus uh, to weird deep water creatures. Um, so there you go. These are your groups of mollusks. I will show the videos in class. Some of you might recognize the one below. Last group, oh no, this is second to the last group. This is Phylum Arthropoda. Now Arthropoda has even more diversity than the mollusks because Arthropoda is where all of the insects go, all of the crabs, all of the shrimp, all of the lobster, anything that has a segmented body, it has jointed limbs, an exoskeleton that they actually have to shed in order to grow, and well-developed organ systems, okay? Very advanced, this group. Some segments uh, form three distinct regions, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. You see this a lot in insects and even in spiders and crabs, although some of those have a combined head and thorax called the cephalothorax, uh, but they have body parts that are recognizable. And this group is really successful. They are the largest and most diverse group of all the animal phyla. More than three quarters of the animals on earth are arthropods, and most of these are insects. Right now, more than 900,000 species have been described and we still haven't finished finding new ones. There are a lot. And you might notice, if you look at this pie chart over here, that the largest group are the Coleopteras. And that group, that's a class by the way, uh, is basically beetles. There are more species of beetles than so many other species on the planet, so many other groups. Again, the characteristics are that they have an exoskeleton. It's another one of the main characteristics, which I've already mentioned, but I wanted to mention that there is um, in addition to having an exoskeleton with external joints that allow them for movement, um, and they're well-developed organ systems, of course, 
there is an advantage to having an exoskeleton um, and there are disadvantages. Uh, basically, an exoskeleton, because it covers the outside of your body, provides you with complete protection, complete protection. And that's pretty good, all right? And it makes them pretty successful. But the disadvantage is that your exoskeleton does not grow with you. And if you don't, if it doesn't grow with you, that means you have to shed it periodically and grow a new one that's a little bit bigger in order to grow. And at that moment, when you shed your exoskeleton, you are really vulnerable to predators. So a lot of them have very specialized ways of hiding when they um, are about to molt. That's what it's called, you molt. But still, so successful that the advantages seem to outweigh the disadvantages for this group, considering how well established and um, far reaching this group is. Arthropods had a lot of firsts as far as the uh, species on Earth go. They were the first to colonize land. Um, that exoskeleton provided both support on a land, because in water you don't need a lot of support because the water supports you, but on land you need more. So the exoskeleton helped with that. And it also pr protected them from drying out. They, allow, they were able to get into lots of different habitats on land that hadn't been colonized by other creatures before. They were the first to fly long before birds. And they also influenced the evolution of flowers because basically the pollinators of flowers co-evolved with the flowers. And over time, both of them became very specialized towards each other. And you can sort of see that in the picture below here that this little fly-like creature here has a perfect proboscis to reach down into this flower. They totally specialized just for this particular flower. Again, I'm going to show you some of this video stuff in class, but I thought you would enjoy that millipede picture. Millipedes are not poisonous, just so you know. And that's where we're going to stop today. Talk to you later.